Morning. Want to sit down? Excellent. Right. We're actually going to start. Julian's going to just show us a little clip while I get myself set up here. This is a bit subtle, this one, so you have to pay attention. about you but my life feels like that sometimes you know putting a lot of um, putting a lot of work in sometimes and maybe we're not putting our work into the right place and um, if we're serious about doing something then we need to make sure that we're we're going about it the right way and yesterday we started off looking at um, the story of the Apostle Peter and how even though he'd failed and even though he would denied Jesus he wasn't disqualified Jesus still loved him came to him reinstated him and then gave him this this great commission and um, I have always um, been excited about what the church is meant to be you know that the, the reason I ended up in in, um, in ministry I suppose was um, I, I grew up in a in a church that was um, was a good church uh, but I nobody really explained anything to me and I never really knew what it was all about. And when I went to university, I met Christians who read the Bible. It's the first time that I'd really met Christians who read the Bible. Before that, I'd had the Bible read to me in church, but um, you know, just a couple of sn- you know, snippets and then a five-minute talk, and that was all I, I got growing up. But when I got to university, I found Christians who read the Bible, and, and I joined them and started reading the Bible with them, and then suddenly got really excited because I discovered what Jesus had done for me, I discovered what the gospel was, and I wanted to tell everybody about it. And um, at the time, I was involved with the college chapel, which was very liberal, really, really liberal. Some of you might remember from the, the sort of 70s and 80s, uh, a professor called Don Cupid, who didn't believe in anything, basically. And he was often on the television talking about how Christianity was sort of just a way of thinking about the world. And uh, He was the, the dean of the college where I was at. And... Um, I was going to a, my home church still, and I was going to a university church, and all these churches were really different, and I started thinking about, about what church was meant to be like, and as I read the Bible, I got this image of, of the church that Jesus promised to build, and, and it got, I, got, I got so excited about it that I, I basically found myself saying, I, would, I will do anything I can to, to build that church and to see that church come on the earth. And um, that's really the the start of how the Lord led me into um, training for ministry. And so my vision has always been to build the local church. That's that's what I'm excited about. Could you flip over so we can get the my one up? There we go. So we've been looking at um, John's Gospel, the end of John's Gospel. And then you start reading on after John's Gospel. The next thing you come to is the, the book of Acts. Jesus has said to Peter, if you love me, feed my lambs. If you love me, feed my sheep. So this question is, do we love Jesus and what are we going to do about it? Well, as we read into the book of Acts, you know, we know that the first thing that happens is they, they wait for the Holy Spirit to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, then they go out full of excitement and they start to preach and to share the gospel. So that's probably a bit like for us. If we have experienced something of the love of God, what next? And often it's a bit like this. You may not know quite what next, but at least take the first step. And often with God, isn't it, that we don't always know everything, but if we know the next thing to do, then he'll meet us there and guide us on to the thing after that. So I always say to Christians, if you're not really completely sure about the future, the best thing to do is to just start doing something, something godly, you know. Start going in the right direction because a moving object is easier for God to steer and harder for Satan to hit. So you might as well go for it. Just, just start doing something. Start moving forward and um, 
God will guide you step by step from there. Now, the problem we have, isn't it, is that the church often isn't what we think it should be. One of my favourite quotes comes from an old Anglican bishop who said, when I read the Bible, everywhere the Apostle Paul goes, I notice there's either a riot or a revival, often both. And then he said, everywhere I go, they offer me a cup of tea. <laughs> and that's often what church is like. It's become sort of um, inoffensive and it's not going to sort of... Um, my wife's sneaking around out there. It's really put me off. Come on. <laughs> Morning, love. Do you want to come in? Oh, okay, carry on. Right. She turned up earlier than expected. It's lovely. Um, so I often kind of think, you know, church is not the church it used to be. You know, we're not like the church in the book of Acts, are we? You know, the, the church in the book of Acts to me seems really exciting and really kind of dynamic. And it has its problems, yeah, just like us. But often it seems to be this amazing kind of explosion of life and growth and, and <laughs> miracles and things happening. And um, that is probably what church is meant to be like. You know, we're, we're meant to be a little bit more like that than we often are. And one of the famous um, passages that describes the life of the early church is at the end of Acts chapter 2. And it starts off by saying, you know, you'll remember this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. Do you remember that? You know, this is what they were, they were worshipping and uh, fellowshipping together, great sense of excitement and signs and wonders were being done, miracles were happening in their midst. And then we read this description of what the, the life of the early church looked like. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Now, that is a vision of church that's worth, I don't know, giving your life for, really, isn't it? To be part of something like that. And probably you've heard um, Warner and others preach on it. I've preached on it, I'm certainly. You know, and said, wouldn't it be great if we were a little bit more like that? Sometimes we look at it and we think, well, actually, I don't know that it would be practical to have everything in common and you know and we, we worry a little bit about the implementation of it but there's something very attractive about being part of a community that looks like that and it's so attractive that daily people would come and, and want to be part of it they would discover that it, it's all based on Jesus and they would want to be saved not sure what Christ Church is like, but I can't say of my church that daily people turn up saying, what must I do to be saved? Your life as a church is so wonderful that I'm so attracted and I want to be part of this community. Well, I'm sure there's a little bit of that going on. You know, there's good, good reports of what God is doing and as we, uh, as we let his spirit um, lead us and guide us, then yeah, people do start to see what God's doing amongst us and they, we start to be a bit more attractive. But the thing that really struck me is that sometimes we look at that and we go, that's possible, but it looks impossible. We know it's possible because it happened on the earth once, but it looks impossible from where we are now. And I think the problem that often happens is, um, as church leaders, we cast a vision for what the church could be, but we don't reflect on the fact that we have to start where we are now. It's like the old joke you know, in Ireland where... Somebody was asking for directions, and he pulled up and asked the man, you know, how'd you get to Dublin? The man said, well, if I was going to Dublin, I wouldn't be starting from here then, would I? You know, well, it's the only place we can start, isn't it? We have to start where we are. This little bit at the bottom, Acts doesn't show us a wonderful utopia, you know, a picture of heaven on earth that miraculously grew because they all were really nice to each other. It shows us what happens after Jesus made disciples and then empowered them to serve him. I think sometimes when we look at these things, we say, let's just love each other a bit more and this will wonderfully happen. But actually, you've got to go a lot further back than that. And um, the secret really is that Jesus had spent a long time getting the church to that stage. He'd, he'd spent three years with them and he'd formed disciples. So if I went do a little Bible study, if I went back to Mark chapter 1, verse 14... This is what happens. It says that after John was put in prison, 
Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news, the gospel. So it starts with an announcement that the kingdom of God is here. And um, some of the translations say the kingdom of God is near. Some of them say it's at hand. I think at hand is probably an easier way of understanding it because it basically means it's there, you just have to take hold of it. It's at hand. Our job is to grasp the kingdom, which is now here, but not fully here yet, so you have to do something to receive it. So Jesus proclaims this, and then he calls people to be with him. So in Mark chapter 3, it says that Jesus went up on a mountainside, and he called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, the first 12 he called apostles, and he appointed them that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. So from the beginning, Jesus called people to be with him and then sent them to go for him. So that that was the start of Jesus calling together his group of followers. Now, what happens after that? Well, after that, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness among the people. And we we know that he was doing that regularly because it's repeated several times through the Gospels. This is what he was doing day by day. So Jesus' day job, if you like, for the three years of his earthly ministry is he would travel around, go through all the towns and villages, preaching the kingdom of God, healing the sick, casting out demons, doing all those sorts of things. So because we're told that he did that regularly, we're, we're to understand that that basically was what the disciples were experiencing day by day. Now, at chapter 9, that little, uh, the second one there, it says, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Um, that's quite a famous uh, passage, because it's when Jesus then looks at the crowds, and he says, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now, in other words, Jesus, as he went around doing this, he saw so much need out there, Probably like you, if you look at your community, you will see so much need. And some of it's obvious because people are really struggling with very obviously bad situations in their families or um, situations of poverty or of illness. And some of it, you know, is hidden behind nice middle class respectability. That it looks good on the surface. People look healthy, they look happy and they look well fed and wealthy. But actually, you know, once you get to know people, that behind the facade sometimes is a lot of struggle, a lot of disappointment, a lot of depression and and misery. And we know, don't we, as we look at our community, we know that for all the good things, there are loads of bad things as well. And Jesus looked and he saw this, this level of need in the crowds. And very famously, Jesus said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. I think at that point, the disciples probably said, Yes, yes, Lord, you know, because it looked like that, didn't it? Lots of need, not many workers, only one Jesus. And then Jesus said, we should pray about it. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. At which point, I think the disciples probably went, yes, Lord, that makes sense. You know, there's a lot of need. There's only one of you. We should pray for more. At this point, Jesus didn't realize he'd come to the end of chapter 9. And he carried on speaking into the beginning of chapter 10. And it says, he called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. At which point the disciples probably said, no Lord, no, you've got the wrong person. We can't do it. We should pray for more people like you. And Jesus looked at them and said, that's just the point. That's what he was saying. He said to them, I am now sending you out. And these are these words. Go to all the children of Israel. Go to the lost sheep of Israel. Remember the ones that he wants us to feed and to tend? As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Well, whose message was that? His message. It's the same message. Go preach the same message I've been preaching. As you go, do these things. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons, give away freely what I have freely given to you. So, whose message? His message. Whose ministry? His ministry. Go and do all the things I've been doing, and I'll give you the same authority, and I'll give you the same power. A little bit breathtaking, that, not it? 
And he says to them, go out into all the towns and villages. And you'll notice here, isn't it? It says that Jesus went throughout Galilee. He went through all the towns and the villages. Have you ever thought about that? What's, what's your mental image of going through all the towns and villages? You know, have you seen Jesus of Nazareth or the Jesus movie or something like that? I have a little happy picture of Jesus walking along a dusty road with the disciples behind him. And usually there's a few children running around and, you know. Um, but your picture normally is Jesus comes into a village and a village is you know, about three or four mud houses, maybe, with a couple of women, you know, smashing wet clothes against a rock, that sort of thing. You know, have you, have you got that mental image? What does it mean that Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages? You know, is it a bit like having a faulty sat-nav? Didn't quite know where he was going. And he's... The last time I did a parish weekend, it was down at Ashburnham. I've been to Ashburnham many times, but I can never remember the route. It's down near Hastings somewhere. So we put Ashburnham Place into the sat-nav and discovered that Ashburnham Place is the name of a stately home that's become a Christian conference centre. It's also the name, unfortunately, of a little cul-de-sac about 30 miles away. <laughs> which is almost in the right direction, so you think, this is probably where I'm going. And um, we end up going through, we went through all the towns and villages of Surrey and Sussex trying to find Ashburnham Place until we ended up in this cul-de-sac and sitting in front of us was this street sign that said Ashburnham Place and we thought, we've got the wrong one. Um, so is it a bit like that? Or was it that Jesus actually was trying to get round every community and make sure every community got to hear the good news and was prepared for what was going to come later. Well, obviously, it's, it's a bit more like the second, isn't it? So what was it a bit like? Well, your mental image and my mental image of the towns and villages is probably wrong. If we go and look at the historians of those times, and the, the, there's nobody who was writing at exactly the same time as Jesus, but we do have a historian called Josephus who wrote 40 years later, so within living memory of the time of Jesus. And I'm sure it hadn't changed that much. But this is what Josephus, who, by the way, is Jewish and not a Christian, um, this is what he says about Galilee. The towns of Galilee lie here very thick, and there are very many villages everywhere so full of people because the soil is so rich. It's really good for farming. The very least of their villages contains above 15,000 inhabitants. It's a bit like Jesus walking into a town and it's the size of Billericay. And elsewhere, Josephus says, the number of towns and villages in Galilee are around about 200. So Josephus is saying there's 200 communities of about 15,000 people. Now, he's probably exaggerating slightly. You know, he's trying to make his, you know, his, his sort of home country sound a bit more impressive than it really is. But he can't be exaggerating that much you know, if we, if we tried to persuade people that Essex was a, you know, Essex is a county full of villages and there are about 700 villages and there are east at least oh, a million people in each of those, you know, you'd only have to visit one of them to know that that's not true. But he's probably describing a much more populous area than we would have imagined. Maybe three million people, something like that. So Jesus' lifestyle... What was Jesus' lifestyle like? Well, if he's going to get round all of those places in three years, what does that take? You know, three years, that's about, how many is that? So three years is about 1,000 days, 200 villages, so that's about five days per village, including travelling time. So basically, Jesus' ministry, and he had to go back to Jerusalem every year as well, didn't he? So that would probably take a few days off as well. So Jesus' ministry basically was wake up in a bed, that was an unfamiliar bed, do some preaching in the town, walk to the next town, um, preach there, heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, do those sorts of things, go to bed in a different bed, wake up the next day and repeat. And he just did that again and again and again over a period of about three years. Now, I, I say that because um, it's probably not what we expected about Jesus' ministry. Everywhere he went, there were crowds. Lonely on the roads, perhaps. But then, when he came into the towns, crowds. And these villages are probably a bit more substantial than we realised. Now, if you're a disciple of Jesus, your job is to become more like Jesus. Now, that's probably a familiar thought, isn't it? 
you know, you're a Christian, you should try and become more like Jesus. I would imagine most of us have reduced that to becoming a bit more like Jesus in how nice he is. In other words, we, we think becoming more like Jesus is to be a bit more like Jesus in his moral life. Does that make sense? Yeah, Jesus doesn't kick puppies, so Christians probably should not kick puppies. You know, Jesus is really nice to people from, from very different backgrounds. He's really merciful, he's really gracious, he's very forgiving. So we know we should become more like that. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? So we know that it's sensible to, for Christians to become more like Jesus in his moral perfection. But actually, you see what Jesus was doing was training the disciples to become more like him in his ministry as well. Every day Jesus went round preaching the kingdom of God, healing the sick, casting out demons, cleansing the lepers, raising the dead, doing those sorts of things. And actually he wants his disciples to do the same. He trained the disciples. He sent them out. He said, off you go. Do the things I've been doing as well. And probably even more than that, not just his ministry, but also his mission. He expected his disciples to always be going to new people, new places, to make sure that everybody had a chance to hear. And when we see that incredible community springing up in the book of Acts, when we look at that and we go, well, maybe, maybe we'd love to see what that would look like in Billericay or in Woodford or in any of our towns. I'd love to see God do something like that. Maybe it isn't just us saying we need to love each other a bit more. Maybe we need to go back to the start and work out what it is to be disciples. You don't get this community in Acts simply by catching a vision for community. If you just read Acts chapter 2 and said, okay, let's try that, probably wouldn't work. You get Acts after three years of Jesus visiting and preparing the soil, training the disciples, and then sending the Holy Spirit to make all of that possible. So really, what we need to focus on, whoops, where'd that come from? Ooh, never seen that one before. Random slide appeared from, from nowhere. Um, really what we need to focus on is making disciples because the book of Acts came because Jesus had spent three years making disciples and then giving him his spirit. So what was Jesus doing with the 12 and the 72 and the crowd and all of those? Well, he was making disciples. And if you like, discipleship is the missing bit in the life of the church. You know, we often talk about church has to go on mission, but mission is the wheels of the car it's discipleship that's the engine. And you'll know this because if Warner stands up and says, right, we're a church, right? Yep, okay. We want people to come to faith, right? Yep, okay. So we're all going to tell our friends about Jesus? Yep, right? Next week's an invitation to service, right? Yep, okay. So you're going to tell as many people as you can this week, right? At this point, most people go, I'm mm, not sure about that, you know. <laughs> And that's a discipleship thing, isn't it? It's us, it's us learning and growing to become natural inv inviters with the way that we are. You know, and a lot of us go, well, I'm actually not the sort of person who's going to sort of uh, you know, stand up on the bus and say, everybody, there's a guest service next week at Christ Church. We'd love you to come. You know, we have to find our own way, and that's discipleship. The engine of discipleship drives the wheels which gives progress for the church. Now, often what's happened in the church is that we are focused on building the church. And all that happens is, because we try and build the church, it's hard work. And people come in, perhaps. They come in, but they don't join in. Does that make sense? If we focus on making disciples, you get the church. If you focus on making the church, you don't get disciples. What you get instead is consumers and our problem is that we have been brought up in a consumer society and sometimes consumerism takes over from discipleship Jesus is trying to make us his disciples but everything in our life tells us to be consumers now you know what a consumer is it, the dictionary says it's someone who purchases something for personal use it's all about me or somebody who consumes, they eats it or, or uses it up. Now, you're surrounded by this. It's not your fault. You have thousands of shopping choices. I don't know what it's like for our friends in Kenya, but 
the richer the country, the more choice you get. When you go shopping in a big Sainsbury's or Tesco's or something, there is a shampoo aisle. You know, what, perhaps some of you remember when you were growing up, there was shampoo. <laughs> Not anymore, no. Every firm that produces shampoo doesn't produce shampoo. They produce about 10 different shampoos. You have shampoo for dry hair, split hair, greasy hair, colored hair, damaged hair, limp hair, lifeless hair. Um, you have it, each of those, in about five different flavors or fragrances, whatever it's worth, for itchy scalps, non-itchy scalps. You have anti-dandruff. It's true, isn't it? You've got millions of choices. And the, why have you got millions of choices? Because you're special. It's all about you. And the advertisers know that. The advertisers are probably... If, if you're looking for a clever person on planet Earth, most of them are in advertising because that's where the money is. And they are really clever people because they work out how to get everybody else to do what they want, which is buy their product. And what do they do? Well, they come up with wonderful slogans. Because you're worth it. <laughs> or um, have it your way. The customer is king. You know, that's a great way of selling product. That is a terrible way of explaining the gospel. The customer's not king. Jesus is king. It's not all about you. You are worth it, but it's not all about you. It's all about him. And so discipleship is the exact opposite of consumerism. And the problem with consumerism is that at some level you have to be part of it. So you have chosen to be here this weekend. Thank you very much. Would have been really disappointing for me if Warner had invited me and then said, nobody wants to come. Um, <laughs> So most of you have taken a bit of a punt and decided to come anyway. But you also chose to be part of your church. So those of you who go to Christ Church, you presumably go to Christ Church because you like it. Is that right? You know, there's, there's, you may have other, other options. You know, there might be St. Elsewhere up the road. And you kind of think, well, I could go to St. Elsewhere, but it's a little bit uh, different from what I'm used to, to be honest. It smells funny and they wear stuff, you know, and they carry candles. and they, I, I, That's a bit too formal for me. I like... You know, the relaxed informality of Christchurch. I could also go to the Living Froth Fellowship down the road, but <laughs> it's crazy down there. I never know what's going to happen, and the services go on for seven hours, and, you know, I don't know what they're talking about half the time, so I don't, like, you know, I choose to go to Christchurch. You're at Christchurch because it, it suits you. You've made that choice. And maybe a few of you are here are saying, no, I hate it, but God wants me here. Um, <laughs> I'm a missionary here to rescue the flock from Warner. Um, but I'm, I'm imagining... That's Moira, actually. Moira's nodding away. Yeah, that's right. That's right. But no, I'm imagining most of you have chosen to be at Christchurch because Christchurch is a good fit and you believe that's where God wants you. Okay. Well, that's okay, but consumerism is dangerous because once we start thinking like consumers, we go, well, I'll stay at Christchurch as long as the worship is worship like I like. And I'll stay at Christchurch as long as the teaching is teaching like I like. And our problem is that is quite dangerous because consumerism is all about the self and a self-focused life leads to death. That's what the Bible says. Jesus said, if you want to keep your life, you will lose it. If you want, if, if you want to save your life, it's the people who lose their life for my sake and for the gospel who will find life. But actually, self-centeredness is the kiss of death. Jesus-centeredness is the kiss and fragrance of life. So consumerism is dangerous. We become consumers, which means we know what we like. After a while, we get pretty good at, at, dis at working out what we like. We become con connoisseurs, a bit like wine tasting. We're well, going to have an experience of wine tasting this afternoon. Wine tasting, you get to learn all the subtle differences, and you get quite good at Seeing the subtle differences. Well, the problem with that is that if you know what you like, you know what you don't like, and you get pretty good at assessing whether something is like you like it or not. So Martin led today, and you go, I love it when Martin leads, but when somebody else leads, you know, it's a little bit different. I prefer this to that. You know, we get very good at making assessments and judgments. Don't tell me you don't do it. You know, those, of us who, you know, those of us who preach on Sundays, we know that the only, you know, it's not only the turkey that gets roast over Sunday lunchtime, it's also, <laughs> it's also the vicar's sermon. It um, gets cut up and dissected and tasted. 
But when we do that and we start making judgments, or I really like her preaching or I don't like his preaching so much, then we become critics. And when we become critics, we're really close to becoming cynics. Because then we go, well, I'm not going to go this week because he's preaching and I won't get anything out of it. And you forget that actually, however good the preacher or however bad the preacher, you actually go to hear God through the preacher. However good the worship, however bad the worship, you go to worship Jesus, who's always worthy of worship. So consumerism is really dangerous. Instead, what we want to be on is a completely different track of worshipping God and allowing that to change the way that we interact with other people. You know the, the little Sunday school thing, joy? You know the definition? J-O-Y. Jesus first, others second. Thinking of yourself last. Um, a few years ago, I think Warner was probably there as well, we had a, a new wine conference. We had a, a man called Dave Workman come and he gave me this picture about this is what the Christian life's meant to be like. We start with selfishness. You know, all of us start self-focused and often self-willed and self-wounded. You know, our whole vision is for ourselves. And actually, we're probably quite hurt and, and needy. But the Christian life is moving from being a selfish person to a seeker of God, becoming a follower of Jesus. Not just following Jesus, but owning our part in Jesus' story, and becoming his disciple. And then disciples are disciples who make disciples. We reproduce. And it's a whole move from self-focused to others-focused. That is a healthy Christian life. That's what it looks like as you go on in the Christian life. I know sometimes we think that the Christian life basically is you learn the rules and you fit into the club. I often said to my church that if we, if we approach the church as if it's a club, then all I would be expecting of you is pay up, give up, you know, turn up, pay up and shut up. That will do. There's something like that. Be you know, if, you could do, if you come on Sundays, if you contribute financially and if you don't cause too much problem, then you'd be a good club member. But Christianity is not a club. Church isn't a club, is it? And that's why you're meant to keep growing, not, not just in the first 10 years of being a Christian, but after 50 years of being a Christian and 60 years of being a Christian, you can always become more focused on other people and less, less insistent on your own way and your own needs. That's the progress towards becoming more and more like Jesus. And that's really what I want to, to sort of um, work on practically with you today, is, is to talk about how we can practically become people who live for others because Jesus has loved us. People who can tend his sheep and feed his lambs because we know that he is feeding us and loving us. And just to, to end with, I'm going to go back to uh, one of those times when Jesus sent out the 72 and it's in um, Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, it's um, the equivalent parallel to where Jesus was talking um, that I read out earlier from Matthew 9 and 10. So in Luke 10, the harvest is plentiful, the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And Jesus said, go, I'm sending you out. And this is, this is the instructions he gives them. He says to them, when you go out, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house if a person of peace is there your peace will rest on them if not it will return to you stay in that house eating and drinking whatever they give you for the worker deserves his wages don't move round from house to house when you enter a town and you're welcomed eat what they set before you heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God is at hand now, I think this is a really helpful way of us thinking about how our churches and our own individual lives can have an impact on the people around us. So when we go, Jesus basically says, practice these four things. First thing is, bless people. We have to be good news before people will listen to good news. One of our problems in the West now is that people think they've heard it all before, although actually they know nothing. And what we have is uh, a really difficult uh, situation where most of the people who live around us and who we encounter during our ordinary everyday lives 
they don't even think about church or Jesus or anything like that. It's just so far away from their way of thinking that we might as well be talking Martian at them when we start trying to tell them a bit about Jesus. They're not aware of it at all. And they see no reason why they should be. So somehow we need to get their attention and surprise them. And to be honest, if we start talking in what they perceive to be religious language, most of them, their hackles will rise and their defences will come up and you won't get very far. Now, we, we need actually to show them something before we tell them something. We need to earn the right to speak and to share. So the first thing we have to do is we have to bless them. And we can do that by speaking or we can do that uh, in practical, tangible ways. And we're going to look at that after the break. Then we should really connect with them. Again, one of the problems we have as church is that often what we've done is um, we have asked people to come into our place on our terms. A lot of churches talk about outreach, but in reality, what we really want to do is in drag. That's what we want to do, isn't it? In drag. We don't actually want to go out to where people are and reach out to them. We'd rather open the door, ring the bell, put a sign up outside, and hope they come in. So, in drag. And there's nothing wrong with in drag. It just doesn't work anymore as well as it used to. We actually have now to go out to people because they have no idea of coming. And what we do is we, we go out and we really connect. And it can be really simple, actually. Um, if you really want to form a friendship with a new neighbour, there are two approaches. One of them is you go, hi, you're new. I want to give you loads of things. And that can work. That's nice, particularly when people are new. It breaks the ice. Actually, I don't know if you've noticed this, a far better way of forming a relationship with someone is to go to them and say, hi, I live next door. I don't know if you could help me, but could I borrow a cup of sugar? <laughs> can I borrow your um, lawnmower? And the reason that works far, far better is because you're not coming in as the person who has it all sorted who is going to be very generous to the poor little person who needs help. You're actually coming in and you're saying, let's do this on a level playing field. I'm actually asking you for help. So I'm giving you the power and making you the big person. These disciples were to eat whatever they set before them. They were, they were just to receive as a way of really forming good, healthy, connecting relationships with people. So let's really try and connect and enter into people's lives. You know, often people won't be interested in what we're interested in until we're interested in what they're interested in. So probably the first place to start with them is not a conversation about the book of Revelation. <laughs> or about, you know, what Jesus is telling you in your quiet time. But entering into their world and, and kind of humbling ourselves like Jesus did. He came from heaven to earth and he engaged us in the earthly place. That's what we need to do. Jesus told them, heal all those who are sick. Well, I de definitely believe in praying for people's healing, but I think it's probably more than that. Healing was a massive need for people in those days. It was expensive, it was hard to get. And the idea that you could actually help somebody practically by praying for them and seeing healing come and they, they would experience God's kingdom and God's love that way. It's really about serving people. Find a way of making their life better. And then, and only then, share the good news with them. Now, it seems to me there's a really interesting order there. The first thing we do is we become a blessing to people. If there is a Christian in your office, talk to the non-Christians and ask them what they think about that Christian. If they're doing it right, then the non-Christians will go, well, I don't really know much about the you know, the faith side of it, and I don't really get the religious stuff that he's into, but, you know, this place is a better place because he's here. I, I love the fact that he's part of this team. That's a Christian. You know, make the, make the world a better place. Your street should be a better street because you're there. You're a blessing. Connect, really connect with people. Don't, don't expect that they will come and join in your activities, but find ways of, of connecting with them. I, I find that really difficult. You know, I find it sometimes it's easier for me to invite people to my house on my terms than it is to accept the reverse invitation to go to their house on their terms, particularly if they don't do things the way I do things. And 
you know, they don't eat the things that I eat, and they, you know, but actually that really was, it forms relationships when you enter into their world rather than demanding they enter into yours. Find ways of serving. Find ways of making their lives better in a tangible way. And then, and only then, I think you get the chance to, to share the good news with them. So I'm going to finish with this slide. Um, and I, I would ask you to maybe, maybe write this in your notebook. Have a think about it. This is you at the centre. Well, okay, remember that Jesus is at the centre. But um, I want you to think about the, all the different contexts in which you meet people. And this is, um, for many people, this would work, you know, work, school, friends, children, sports, church, hobbies. Some of you, you might have like three or four contexts, you know, family, friends, work, church, possibly hobbies, you know, four or five. You might have a few things like that. What I'd like you to reflect upon is who you meet in those places. Who's there? What are the names of the people in those places? How many of them don't know God or far, far from him? Because you're probably there as part of Jesus' plan for those lost sheep to be fed and to experience his love and hopefully to come to find their shepherd. You know, you're, you're in the bowls club, not only because you like playing bowls, but God has put you there so that the other people who are in the bowls club might actually see something of what it is to be a Christian. And you don't have to go straight in with telling them what it is to be a Christian. No, you, you start here. You start by being a blessing. You start after having been a blessing, you start by forming deeper relationships and you find ways to really serve them in time of need and then you get the chance to tell them. So there's your homework. Have a think, have a pray about that and now have a coffee. And we're going to come back in half an hour when my lovely wife will be joining me. Okay, so it's coffee time. We're going to back here at 11 o'clock and um, we'll press on after that.